There we go. Bonjour tout le monde. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Linda Barber, and I am the branch manager of the Ottawa branch That's of the nice. National Association. Sorry? You're all set, Linda. Keep going. Oh, okay, there we go. Uh, once again, hi, everyone. I'm the branch manager of the Ottawa branch of the National Association of Federal Retirees. I'd like to begin this afternoon by acknowledging that the land on which our branch office is located is on traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. On behalf of Ottawa Branch, I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's webinar from Ingenium called Canada, Canadian Pacific 1201, when a locomotive is more than just a machine. And we welcome our presenter, Sharon Babian. She's the curator of Marine and Land Transport. And she explores the rich history of mobility in Canada to understand how we develop and use and, and uh, understand transport technologies. Her work seeks to explore the many cultural meaning, meanings of transport artifacts and to uncover the source of emotional power as symbols of a cherished past. Sharon's also written a history of the Canadian Science and Technology Museum. And uh, we also have with us today Andre Laflamme from Ingenium. He's the manager of membership and reservation services. It's thanks to the hard work of both Sharon and Andre that you have this wonderful webinar this afternoon. They note que le webinar sera présenté en anglais, mais la participation bilingue est toujours encouragée. Now, I also want to give a special welcome to anybody here in the webinar who is not yet a member of this association. You're certainly welcome, and we hope that this experience will be so interesting to you that you will actually decide to become a member. And for those of you that are already our members, of course, we hope this kind of experience reinforces the value that we're trying to bring to you and that you want to stay a member. At the end of the presentation, which will be about 30 minutes from Sharon, there'll be a question and answer period. And all you'll need to do is to type your questions into the chat box, uh, the Zoom chat box, and I'll read them out loud so that Sharon or perhaps Andre can answer them. We're recording today's webinar, so when it's over, you're gonna get an email from uh, Aaron Higgins at Ottawa Branch, and that'll explain to you how to access the recording, how to get uh, uh, access an electronic copy of Sharon's slides, and you'll also get some information on if you're thinking about giving the gift of membership to somebody, how that would be easy to do. Now, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Sharon, from Ingenium Canada. Thank you, and, and thanks to everyone for being here today. Um, uh, first, I'll give you a little bit of background. As some of you will know, Ingenium is a federal crown corporation that comprises three national museums pictured in this slide, the Canada Agriculture and Food Museum, the Aviation and Space Museum, and the Science and Technology Museum. The other image on this slide is of our new Ingenium Center, which is a state-of-the-art conservation and collection storage facility. So, okay, I'm having problems. Oh, there we go. I need to use my mouse. Um, so here's, the, here's our mandate. As you can see, it's, it's quite a broad mandate. And over the course of more than 50 years, uh, we've built the most comprehensive collection of its kind in Canada. We collect based on the premise that artifacts are physical evidence of human invention, activity, and need. Because of this, they embody the lives and times of the people who made, adapted, and used them. In a world where few people leave a systematic written record of their experiences, these objects are often the most compelling evidence of how many Canadians lived their lives and the contributions they made to their communities and their country. But as I've discovered and rediscover every day, an artifact never has just one story to tell. The more you study it in its historical context, the more your assumption your assumptions about what makes it interesting and important shift. Today I'm going to talk to you about one large object, a late era steam locomotive, and share with you some of the unexpected places this locomotive has taken me, which is interesting because of course it doesn't move anymore. Um, at Ingenium, we collect objects because of what they can tell us about Canada's history. 
we have various criteria that help us to evaluate the significance of each piece. Not surprisingly for museums of science and technology, our work usually starts with an assessment of the scientific and technological importance of an artifact. So here's 1201's official history. In the mid 1940s, most of Canadian Pacific's branch line and secondary mainline locomotives were well past their normal retirement dates. The harsh realities of almost 10 years of severe depression had forced the railway to limit its building program. Then the unprecedented demand for military equipment for the war effort forced them to delay replacement a second time. The workers at CP's Angus and other shops managed to keep the aging fleet on the rails, but there's a limit to how many times a locomotive can be repaired and rebuilt. By 1943, with the war effort on sound footing from a supply perspective, CP's Motive Power Department began work on a new locomotive that they hoped would take the place of many of the older engines. In order to do that, the new locomotive had to be able to run on all or almost all of CP's huge rail network, which meant that it had to be lighter than its predecessors. All of the research, design, fabrication and construction work was done in-house. And the resulting locomotive, the G5A, was a modernized version of the popular G1 and G2 Pacific type. Though they looked the same in general proportions, the new locomotives embodied, embodied much that was new in design materials and equipment. These features meant that the new locomotives were lighter and faster than their predecessors. They were lighter by up to 10,000 pounds and their design speed of 70, they had a design speed of 70 miles per hour, but could exceed it by as much as 20 miles per hour. That's very fast for a steam locomotive. CP put the two prototypes, 1201, 1200 rather, and 1201 into service in 1944. And they were so successful that the company commissioned the Montreal Locomotive Works and the Canadian Locomotive Company to build 100 more between 1945 and 1948. As the demand for goods, services and travel surged following the war, these locomotives quickly became the workhorses of our economic recovery. So much so that CP planned to have as many as 600 built. By the early 1950s though, the railways had already begun converting their fleets to diesel electric power. And so it was that 1200 and 1201 became the last steam locomotives designed and built by Canadian Pacific. So here are some of the other facts worth noting about the locomotive. Engine crew loved this locomotive. They, they um, Duncan Dufresne, who was a Canadian Pacific fireman and became a volunteer at the museum, um, and the fireman's the crew member responsible for uh, maintaining the, the fire and keeping the steam up. He worked on these, on these locomotives and he called them, quote, the biggest little engines on the roster. And they were little, they were called light Pacifics for a reason. And he enjoyed working on them because they were snappy, easy to handle and had comfortable cabs for steam engines. The one downside from the crew's point of view was their light weight. Rates of pay were partly based on a measure known as weight on drivers, that is the weight carried by the six large driving wheels. Since G5s were comparatively light, 151,000 pounds on drivers, crew were paid less than they would have been for a heavier locomotive. So there's some statistics on, on where 12, 1201 ran. 1200 was sent out to the West and operated mainly in the West. Um, so now you have some idea of why the locomotive was considered a worthy addition to the national collection. But as important as it is, this official history is really only part of 1201's story. When I began to explore how the locomotive came to be saved, a whole new narrative unfolded. By the late 1950s and early 1960s, railway companies across North America retired and destroyed thousands of steam engines. They preserved a precious few because they were iconic or technologically significant designs. Others, especially the common all-purpose engines like 
the G5s, generally survived by serendipity. Someone knew someone who had a museum contact or an unused rail siding. What survived was often quite random by type and by region. But 1201 story is different. When it was built in 1944, it was just another late era steam locomotive. At the time, materials, workers, and time had to be borrowed from more important war-related production. The CP shops at, in Montreal, the Angus shops, built Valentine tanks, but they also built triple expansion engines for Corvettes. So this was considered the most urgent work. And so the project, to, be, to, to get the project done, they had to kind of borrow from these other projects. And since Canadian Pacific then proceeded to order the construction, of a hundred more just like it, 1201 must have seemed utterly unremarkable. When its service life came to an end in 1959, it sat like hundreds of other locomotives. I'll go back to that previous slide. There we go. It sat like hundreds of other locomotives awaiting its date with the cutting torch. Officially consigned to the scrap line in 1962, it should not have survived much past that year. Angus workers were as efficient at dismembering these machines as they had once been at building and rebuilding them. So how did it survive? According to more than one source, every time 1201 got to the, near to the front of the line, and you can see how long these lines are, the workers would move it to the back of the line. Now moving a locomotive out of a long line is something you cannot do covertly or by yourself. It required switching and shunting and the complicity of yard workers like hostlers, switchmen and dispatchers, all actively cooperating in an unsanctioned operation. But this went on for a full four years until CP offered 1201 to the National Museums of Canada. So why did the workers save this locomotive? It may be that contrary to appearances, railway workers are soft, sentimental types. But it may also be that by 1962, this locomotive had come to represent more than nostalgia for them. By that time, the, Ang the workers at Angus shops knew that this would be the last steam locomotive designed and built in-house, bringing an end to six decades of innovative industrial production. They could also see that the dramatic, they could also see the dramatic consequences of the end of steam power. Um, and they knew what that would mean for them and for thousands of other railway workers across Canada. Steam railways were very labor intensive enterprises as steam locomotives not only use a lot of fuel, but also require regular and sometimes major maintenance throughout their working lives. Every rail line needed a series of staff coaling and water stations, and every region needed a network of roundhouses capable of running repairs, those are the smaller repairs, and larger shops equipped to reboiler and rebuild complete locomotives. For example, 1201 had its first major work done in 1948, less than four years after it was outshopped at 20, 226,000 miles. It was then again taken out for major service in 1949 and in 1951. The work was done by a veritable army of skilled tradesmen like machinists, boiler makers, pipe fitters, and less skilled laborers who worked in the iron and mold and iron molding and casting areas. Almost all steam trades were made redundant by diesel electric motive power. And because these locomotives were, and because diesel locomotives were not built or rebuilt in house and need much less maintenance overall than their steam counterparts, the railways gradually reduced their overall workforce in the shops. As a result, Angus, C, as a result, CP and CN cut about 50,000 jobs in the few years during and immediately following the conversion process. Some of these shots are of CP and of Angus and others are comparable sites in Winnipeg and uh, one in Transcona. So many steam related trades involved hard, dirty and even dangerous work. At the same time, though, they, these were skilled jobs and they provided relatively stable employment and decent pay, 
The one exception was during the depression, of course, when, when even the railways had to cut back their, um, their staffs. And even for the unskilled or less skilled positions, work was steady and there, was pl there were plenty of opportunities for training and promotion given the size of the railway companies and their diverse labor needs. Both CN and CP were known to train and promote from within. And it was not unusual to find skilled tradesmen making their way into senior technical positions like head of motive power. Steam railway jobs, in other words, had provided careers for many generations of workers, and now they were disappearing in large numbers. So in addition to secure jobs, the Angus shops and others like it gave birth to and sustained nearby communities. In Montreal, CP developed the area around the shops beginning in 1905. Rosemont, as it came to be called, boasted better housing and amenities than most, work, than most workers' communities, including indoor plumbing and proper heat and ventilation. There were also sports fields and a library. Like most large companies, CP also organized annual events for its workers and their families. Though labor relations weren't always the best and there were strikes, the community itself provided continuity, stability, and support to generations of families. This is a shot of Weston, and I use this one because you can actually see the, the community of Weston uh, beside the shops there. This is now right in the center of Winnipeg, and it's quite controversial. They keep wanting CP to move these yards, and um, it would be an absolutely monumental task, whereas the Angus yards were just um, closed and taken down, as you'll see. But with the decline of employment, and here, here's a, a picture I just love. Someone at our, in our library posted this on, our, uh, on Twitter this week. The, the, the uh, band at the Transcona shops, which was a CN yard. So. But with the decline of, of employment, the communities surrounding Angus and other shops like it began a steady decline as the ties that bound them together slowly weakened and frayed. The loss of so many jobs and so many co-workers also dealt a severe blow to the sense of security, sense of a strong sense of identity and self-worth that had come from knowing that your family and your work kept the railways running and the economy humming. Having survived the Great Depression and made major contributions to the war effort, these proud people must have felt betrayed by the company and country they had so faithfully served. In this context, it's not surprising really that the workers at Angus came to see 1201, not only as physical evidence of their labors, but also as a powerful symbol of a time when they, their work and their communities mattered. A little extra work moving the locomotive out of harm's way was a small price to pay for ensuring that it survived to tell their story. And when you look at the locomotive now in its new home in our Ingenium Center, where it's properly lit and not covered in plastic as it was in our old warehouse, you really get a sense of how important this locomotive is. You look at it and see all its complexity and you can almost, you can see, but you can almost feel the skill and hard work that went into creating it and keeping it on the rails the beautifully machined rods, the large driving wheels and massive springs. All of this embodies the lives of generations of railway workers, their expertise and their families' lives. So here's an example of what's left of Angus. As I said, the Weston shops are still alive in a, in a much reduced way, but they're still there but Angus is completely gone. So this is all that's left. Um, I'm sorry, the quality of the slide isn't great, but, or the photo isn't great, but it gives you some idea of where that Loblaws is. So embedded in this locomotive is the history of post-war Canada. It is a product and symbol of the industrial capacity Canadian railways built up over a century, allowing them to design and construct a complete locomotive from the ground up. This is something that I talk to people about 
all the time when I show them 1201 and some of our other locomotives, they, including the ones that are on the floor of the museum, it's hard for people now to imagine the industrial capacity that existed in that, in that yard, in that, in that um, um, shop. It was incredible. Uh, they could mold iron, they could cast iron, they machined metal. They had uh, uh, car barns where they built freight cars and some passenger cars. They had fine sort of cabinet maker level uh, woodworkers as well as carpenters. They, it, it was, they had their own fire department, their own medical staff, their own libraries. It was really a remarkable place and it really, um, as I said, educated and, and trained generations of workers. So you, you begin to see that when you actually look at the locomotive and talk about what it took to machine the main rods, for example, on, that drive the locomotive. It also represents our extensive and reliable transportation network the massive resources it takes to maintain and upgrade it, and it still takes those resources, and the enormous contribution rail transport made to our war effort and post-war recovery. CP1201 is also the culmination of more than 100 years of steam motive power development, the technology that powered Canada well into the 20th century. But even as the workers at Angus were building it, the locomotive was a technology of the past. Around it swirled the forces of rapid and massive technological change. By the time 1201 hit the rails, scientists and engineers were already designing the first jet engines and laying the groundwork for nuclear power generation and the Kandu reactor. When it was retired in 1959, Canada's transcontinental microwave the telecommunications network was up and running. But 1201 reminds us that technological change for all its advantages also has high costs and it often brings massive dislocation and profound loss in its wake. This is a story we haven't always told in science and technology museums. For example, we extol innovation, speed and efficiency and the invention and deployment of new technologies like mechanical and electronic telephone switches. But we don't really dwell on the thousands of operators who were put out of work by those technologies. And we've only begun to explore the reasons why people often have such strong emotional attachments to artifacts. This is why we need to remind ourselves that an object's history, and when I say we, I mean we the curators and people that work in museums, we need to remind ourselves that an object's history is never just about invention and industry. It's also about collective identity and personal memories of lives lived and great things achieved together. So what became of 1201? Sorry. So what became of 1201 after its rescue from the grim scrapper? In 1966, after a quick paint job at Angus Shops, CP transferred 1201 to the museum, where it took up its place along with the other steam locomotives in the newly constructed locomotive hall. As it turns out, the hall was actually kind of constructed around the locomotives, um, but um, I didn't find a good slide to show that, so you'll have to just try and imagine it. Um, but this quiet life lasted only four years. In 1973, we laid track and pulled the locomotive out of the locomotive hall and sent it down to Toronto. It was where, because we had agreed to make 1201 the cornerstone of a proposed steam excursion program operated jointly by the Bytown Railway Society and the National Capital Commission. So it took about three years to make 1201 operational again. But as soon as the work was complete, the locomotive began excursion service. 
It quickly became a local celebrity as people not only rode the train whenever they could, but also came out in large numbers just to watch 1201 and its vintage rail cars pass by. Its reputation spread well beyond the region when it steamed out to BC to help celebrate the 100th anniversary of the driving of the last spike in November 1985. During its 17 years of excursion service, 1201, like any steam locomotive, needed a great deal of repair and maintenance work. Fortunately, most of that work could be done in-house with museum tools and the expertise of the Bytown Railway Society and our conservation staff. Again, I had some images of them working in this little mini forge to do some uh, swaging, but uh, the resolution was so bad that I didn't think that it would be very useful for you to see those images. By 1990, though, it had become clear that after so many miles, the locomotive needed much more work than we could do in-house and more than we could realistically afford to have done outside. So the museum decided to retire 1201 from service. The curator at the time knew that it would be an unpopular decision, not just for the team that operated and maintained the locomotive, but also for the people of the National Capital Region and live steam enthusiasts everywhere. As a relatively new employee at the time and a relatively new resident of Ottawa, I was blissfully unaware of the controversy or the strong feelings surrounding this locomotive. That all changed a few years ago when a group of students at, from Carleton University decided to make a short documentary about 1201 for their class project. Using our archives and his, oral history interviews with team members from Bytown and the museum. The student's film called Losing Steam told the story of this locomotive's birth, near death and rebirth in Ottawa. They managed to capture the sheer joy of making this machine go and the sense of pride in sharing it with Canadians. The, the people in the film talked about how they were using 1201 to take the history of steam railways out of the museum and into, the, and into people's lives. The film also captured the profound sadness the team felt when they shut off the steam for the very last time. When we moved 1201 from the rented warehouse where it had languished for almost 30 years into our new Ingenium Center, I saw how the public felt about this piece of our past. The event we arranged was meant to begin about 7 a.m. so that it didn't interfere with um, visitors coming to the museum. And the, because we were moving the locomotive over one of our main parking lots. So, but people started showing up well before, like I'm talking about six in the morning, they started showing up. And then, then they just kept coming. It was quite surprising. Even though the locomotive was being pushed by a little diesel locomotive, it was not under its own steam. Everyone wanted to see it and be part of it. Random people came up to me to tell me how much 1201 meant to them for all kinds of reasons. Some were joyful, others wistful and a bit teary-eyed. I was stunned and humbled by the depth of emotion I saw that day. When I had a chance to collect my thoughts later on, I was reminded of something I'd read a long time ago about the uses of the past. People, the author argued, need the past for many reasons. Nostalgia, the chance to escape from a, for a moment from our fast paced world into a simpler past is one of those reasons. But it's not the only one. Some of us look to the past for the comfort that a sense of continuity, stability, and certainty can provide in times of upheaval and dramatic change. For others, it provides guidance and enrichment by making their lives part of a larger and part of a much larger history of creation, loss, and recreation. For most of us, the past is an integral part is integral rather to our sense of identity as individuals and as members of a community or citizens of a nation. It gives meaning, purpose and value to our lives in ways we often don't even realize. So all of that in a septuagenarian locomotive. It makes you wonder what other stories are waiting to be discovered in the Ingenium Center 
doesn't it? And speaking of the Ingenium Center, I'm here to tell you that NAFR members are entitled to a 15% discount on Ingenium membership purchases. Not only are our museums a great place for children and families, we also make significant efforts to organize presentations and sessions for mature audiences like this one. We're planning on organizing a number of these special events for members, including evenings with the curators and sneak peeks at our reserve collection. If this presentation interested you, and I sure hope it did, and you'd like to participate in similar experiences, please consider becoming a member of Ingenium. Thank you very much. And I'm now ready to take questions. Excellent, Sharon, thank you so much. And for sharing that story, uh, it's just beautiful. And, and to reflect on the people who cared for that locomotive and built her and kept her going and saved her, despite the, the impacts on their lives when she stopped running. It's, uh, it's 